Casey Adams, welcome to the Because and Effect podcast. It's great to have you here. Tanse. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know you're incredibly busy these days, but as a educator, mentor, and social practice artist based in Winnipeg, um, I know you're a very busy person. So thank you so much for your time and just for your energy and for your uh, sitting down and talking to us today. I'm really happy to be here and talk about art. Talking about art. Well, let's talk about social practice artist. Uh, You just told me that term before we started recording. So like, what does that mean exactly? I I haven't heard that term before, but I'm intrigued as to as to what it means. It's a it's a different way of thinking really uh, about an artist. And uh, since I've been kind of working this way for a very long time before I even knew what a social practice artist was, I decided that I would use it as as my sort of title. And really what it is, is uh, an artist who uses community as part of their practice. So um, when I say uses, I don't mean uses. Uh, they they um, include. So it's about inclusion. It's about thinking about social issues uh, when you're creating um, and including a community in the part of your practice. Very cool. So yeah. obviously the community right now is under a pandemic and we've been locked down for a number of months and almost over a year, I guess over a year now. How has mm-hmm. your your community and your response to the pandemic been and, and how have you been doing personally? How have things been going? Well, actually my family and I have been doing really well. We're in a place of privilege. We, we um, have a home that uh, our own home. So uh, We've been pretty fortunate. It's just my son and my husband, and we've been able to um, take care of one another, go for walks, and just be safe. So we've been very, very fortunate. I know it's not the same for everyone else out there. So I really recognize that kind of privileged position that I'm in. Um, In terms of thinking about community, of course, you know, that's hard to do when you're in lockdown. (laughs) So uh, the thing I really um, appreciate about what has come out of like the fallout of what's been happening is um, this video conferencing that's been happening. So I've been actually be, I'm able to go into um, conferences that I'd never be able to be part of because of funding, not being able to travel to it. Um, And hearing, uh, people talk about things that I'm interested in and just being able to sit at home and listen in on these conversations and be part of these kind of virtual conversations as well. Um, so that's been, been exciting. Um, and then, uh, coming up, uh, I'm part of a, a group that has an annual Nibe gathering, which is means water in Ojibwe and, uh, coming May, we're going to do a virtual uh, Nibe gathering, which is usually out on the land um, in the White Shell Park area uh, near Bannock Point. And we, we elders, scholars, educators, uh, students, basically anybody who's interested in learning about water um, come together for this. And we usually do it out on the land, no toilets, no running water. We're just on the land learning, and which is, honestly how it should be but we're going to do it virtually this year so Mm -hmm. that's kind of one of the adjustments that happens with um because of this pandemic and um i'm able to teach about uh clay Mm -hmm. and how it connects to land and water in this in this gathering so it's going to be really exciting very cool. I've been sort of talking to friends and, and family and artists and mu- musicians and people who I've connected with. And I think we're kind of due for a bit of an artistic renaissance after this, because, you know, <laughs> when you're stuck inside with, you know, the guitar sitting in the set for me personally, you know, you can't help but just, well, I got nothing else to do when I'm inside 23 hours a day, but might as well work on some art. So do you think that we're sort of due for a a really a burst and, and a, an explosion of artistic expression throughout this pandemic, or have you been less than you know motivated? I think it actually has already been happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, when you think about uh, uh, people are starting to recognize their priorities, you know, um, not not talking about myself, but uh, lots of people kind of got caught in the work grind and they just going through the motions and uh, their priority, which is their family, which is why they're working so hard. Um, you know, that time, that precious time that they have with their family uh, got 
lost along the way, you know, cause you're so tired from getting home. Who wants to do anything? And um, the pandemic has kind of forced us to all sit down and slow down and take a, a contemplated look at our life. And a lot of people are going towards art, you know, music, um, dance, mm. you know, I see a lot of um, online virtual um, workshops for dance, for music, for art, and it's allowing people to channel into that side of them that I would even say blood memory, uh, where their ancestors were creators. And they're kind of rejecting this idea that, oh, I'm not an artist. Mm. And they're starting to think, well, I may not be an artist, but I, I know I can create. And they're um, really enjoying that. Um, for those that are suffering um, and who are, you know, the pandemic has been very anxious for them and it's been very difficult. Um, you know, my recommendation is always, you know, about creating. Mm -hmm. It's it's something, It's a it helps um, release serotonin and uh, it helps um, connect them back to self. I feel like there's nothing more human than the act of creation. Like it's something fundamental to our, uh, you know, I have I, some of my greatest moments and memories are, you know, writing songs with friends or, or you know, performing different things and creating art. And you just, it, it almost scratches an itch that's just inherently human. Right. And I, I don't know how to, whenever people say like, Oh, I'm not an artist. I'm, Oh, I can't draw. I can't sing. I can't, whatever. I, I just, that nothing frustrates me more because all it takes is a little bit of practice and just to get up, get, get that voice out of your head saying you're not, you can't do it because the only re re reason people can do it is because they practice. Right. And like, so what yeah. do you, what do you feel when people say like, Oh, I'm, I'm not an artist. How do you respond well, to that? Well, I, I started doing artists in the schools and learning through the arts and uh, what it was, I would go into schools and I would teach kids. Uh, sometimes it was for learning through the arts. Uh, you take a subject and you use art to reinforce that learning process so you work with the teachers you know really intimately and you come up with like lesson plans to help these kids who are kinetic learners right um and uh artists in the schools i come in and i have a set program where i teach about pottery and the the biggest thing for me was to teach the teacher mm. to let go of all of those like childhood trauma <laughs> towards art mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. where they didn't draw it good enough for their teacher. The teacher felt that they weren't close to what they were drawing or they look at their work and go, well, there, here's what I'm seeing in real life and here's what I'm drawing and they're completely different. Um, that's uh, for their minds, that's terrible. Like it doesn't work. So in their definition, oh, I can't do art. But I always tell people that art is like sports, okay? You don't have to be a professional athlete to kick a soccer ball around, right? Anybody can do it. As long as you have a foot that you can kick with or an artificial foot that you can kick, kick with, you can play soccer. You don't have to be a professional, but you can do it, right? And it's good for the mind, body, and soul. And the same goes with art. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a professional artist to pick up a paintbrush. Right. And so you have to get past that stigma of the European way of thinking of what an artist is, because in my um, in in my uh, background, I'm part Cree, part Ojibwe, part British, and um, all of my ancestors created and and practiced what we think of art. Right. Um, and in my Cree and Ojibwe side. You had to create because that was our way of communicating. That was kind of like our, um, you would create garments that you would wear into ceremony or you would create ceremonial items. And you had to do that. Otherwise, let's say we wouldn't have a good hunt or uh, we'd have a bad season or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like a way of praying. Mm. And so if you didn't do art, you're in big trouble, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, no kidding. so it's the, when you start thinking about art in terms of a, um, a meditation yeah. or as a way to 
uh, soothe or a way of connecting to your ancestors uh, as a spiritual practice uh, that's entirely possible um, then it suddenly is no longer oh only like elite people can do this right. suddenly it's like oh i have access to this and i have rights to this and uh nobody can take that away from you yeah so many conversations i've been having lately talk or some, for some reason the word presence comes up and being present in the moment mm. and being presence and i feel like just the process of any artistic endeavor really helps to train your ability to be present in the moment and to understand how that goes have you always done this or was this a you know like what is your relationship to presence over your career as an artist and how has that evolved? I think it's always been a uh, part of uh, my intuitive practice mm. uh, right from being a child uh, sitting in the corner, playing with a little piece of string. Um, my parents thought I was slightly touched. They were a little worried about me, but really what I was doing was I was tapping into that being present, um, playing with texture, um, mm. using my sense of touch, uh, just, uh, it's, it's been a part of who I am for a very long time. Beautiful. And, you know, something like that you can cultivate, mm. you know, just like, uh, playing soccer. If you're a terrible soccer player, well, you just practice and you can get better. You may not become that professional athlete, but you can become better and the same goes with the creating process and but also about being present and right. i think intuition a lot of people don't put a lot of credence into intuition and um i think it's one of the most important aspects of my career is my ability to to understand what works and what won't work mm -hmm. using my intuition and so that, I will yeah. always use my mind in my decision-making process, but intuition um, can definitely has helped me have the success that I had, I've, I've had so far. Right. Absolutely. And it's been quite, quite, as I mentioned before, the successes of perception was when you first came on my radar, seeing, you know, in all the photos everywhere. Uh, do you want to make, take me back? When was that? 2015 ish, 2016 around there? 20. Well, the 2014 was the 2014? mayoral candidate race at okay. that time. Um, I guess back in 2004, I was part of a indigenous softball league and my sister-in-law who's non-indigenous would often come and watch us play with my brother and I and um one day she said you know I had no idea indigenous people were so normal and I thought what wow. <laughs> she said well outside of your family really the only time I see indigenous people are is like on the streets begging for money or drunk or 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 in the newspaper in the media mm they're depicted in a negative way and i realized okay yes there is definitely an image problem there's definitely um a lack of understanding and knowledge because media has played such a big role in keeping that stereotype mm -hmm. perpetually going right so i knew i had to do a piece about perceptions um, towards Indigenous people, but I didn't know how to do it because in a gallery space, um, you know, a curator chooses the work and then two years or three years later, it's in the space and what, maybe 500,000 people see the work. And I knew that I needed to create something where lots of people saw it and that it had an impact. And so this is where social practice, my thinking mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. always been. Um, so fast forward when the mayoral candidate, Gord Steve's wife, um, Lord uh, Lori Steve's had said, um, she had written a post on Facebook a few years earlier about uh, indigenous men, native men, I think she used the term. And it was really, um, there was a lot of in, um, inaccuracies. There was a lot of um, bigotry uh, stereotypes in it. And I knew I had to do something. And that's when the light bulb went off. You know, I've been thinking about this for 10 years, mm -hmm. how to do it. And it was like, ugh, social media, yeah. you know, her words got out through right. social media, my words need to come out through social media. So I did a call out and I asked people who wanted to participate. And uh, so it became a community thing. Like I used my image as well. But 
um, I was really asking them to stick their neck out, you know, I, I didn't know how it was going to be perceived. I didn't know how <laughs> people were going to react to it. And, you know, I warned them that this might get ugly, um, but they were still willing to do it. You know, they, they trusted me and um, we sent it out. I sent it out into the world like the next day. Um, I worked over at the weekend and what I found out later was that was the weekend they found Tina Fontaine. Oh, wow. Right. And um, yeah, it was, it was really, it was really weird timing. Mm -hmm. um, it was really tough and um, lots of people immediately reacted to it. Yeah. I remember the first time seeing it. I think I was just waiting for the bus or something. And I was like, what is this? Like as soon as you, it, it's, it's such a simple concept, but so brilliantly executed and it's so thought provoking. And you know, everyone who saw it is like, what is this? And then you look into it a little bit further and it's just so incredible. How did you feel when you kind of saw it up on, you know, billboards and bus shacks and in everywhere that, cause it felt like it was just everywhere for, for a, a yeah. year and a bit. How did you feel walking past and seeing your work and, and, you know, seeing people see it and, and, and starting those conversations? It was pretty proud. It was a proud moment, especially when I had my mom with me because my mom eventually participated in it. Uh, she's never been really proud of her Indigenous heritage. So um, when she came to me and said, I, you know, I wouldn't mind posing. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't know my process. So she didn't know how I did it. And so what I, what I did is I recalled some really ugly memories in her. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would sit my, my subject, my model, uh, or collaborator. Um, and I would say, uh, look into the camera. Don't think just hear my words. And so I started telling her to think about the time when she was a little girl and people started calling her a dirty little Indian. And immediately, I only got four shots in, she, her eyes started to well and she started to cry. And it just, it threw me because most of the participants up until that point were younger indigenous um, people who um, didn't buy into the stereotype and were just like, we're mm -hmm. tired of this, we wanna make change. Whereas my mom really grew up in the crux of it, like really deep racism and discrimination. So when she heard those words, she started to cry. And that was really tough. Um, and then the next photo is where I would say, oh, think of something really great. Usually it's like, think about the first time you made out with your husband. <laughs> I wasn't working with her. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe grandkids so, would, would help. Yeah, or, so yeah. it was like the first time you held your grandchild, yeah. you got that real genuine smile and happiness and glow that, that's in her photo. So when we're out on the streets and uh, we saw her um, billboard, not billboard, but bus shelter poster. Um, yeah, it was, it was amazing to see that people hear her story and felt her pain because you could see the tears in her eyes. And it was, um, yeah, it was really, it was amazing. Um, For sure. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a little bit about art as a healing tool. Um, do you think it is one? I think I know the answer to that. And <laughs> um, Leading question. <laughs> yeah. How, how has art, how have you used art as a healing tool? And, and how do you think people, uh, how do you help people understand that it can be used as a healing tool? Maybe is a better question. Right. Well, we're, you know, we were talking about being present. Um, that's one of the first things that, that helps uh, me ground myself. Mm. Like, um, it doesn't happen often where I'm so crazy busy that um, I can't focus. Uh, but art brings me back to earth. It grounds me. It reminds me of the importance of, of calm. Uh, I like to think that it's a cortisol release releaser that uh, that stress hormone uh, dissipates when, whenever I start doing art. Um, we all know that uh, children of child abuse, uh, they use art therapy to help them describe what has happened to them, um, but it also helps release whatever has happened to them. It allows them to create a world that they want to live in. Um, so uh, art has, you know, been my, I guess, savior for my entire life and, and really art has 
put me on this pathway that um, has allowed me to live a life that I want to lead. Mm. So I'm not, I'm not living by anyone else's constructs because really when you think about it, who moves to Montreal to go to school where they can't speak a word of French with $800 in their pocket? Yeah, nobody does in their right mind. So I've used my instincts and I've let art kind of guide me and I'm living the life that I want to lead. Yeah. You mentioned before about intuition and, and, you know, just kind of trusting your gut. I feel like sometimes we tell our kids the opposite or we teach our, you know, just you don't listen to that voice. Like, you know, you, where, so how do you encourage people to trust their gut and trust their intuition and, and, and just go believe in themselves in that way? Like, how have you, uh, how do you get that message out? Yeah, it's, it's like, like anything else, it requires a lot of practice. Um, and I usually get people to start with something as simple as um, a chocolate bar going into a candy shop, seeing a whole list of chocolate bars. And I get them to not choose the one that they usually choose because I'm, 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 I'm a creature of habit mm -hmm. for sure. But um, something like just feel which one is going to be the best one for you right now mm -hmm. and trust that choice, right? And it's, it's something really super simple and they may take it and then re recognize right away that, no, this was a bad choice. Were you really using your intuition right. at that point in time or were you other things playing? So it's really, those are little things that you can do to start on your journey. And it really, it, it really is helpful because your, your intuition is, has this, um, it comes from your inside. It comes from your ability to, to know what's right for you. And um, a lot of times people ignore that and they make, they choose the wrong way. And then they, they're upset with themselves later on down the road. If you can really tap into that, your body is telling you already what you should be doing yeah. and, and how important it is to listen to it. And, and for me, it's always about trying to seek out the best choice for me. Yeah. I, well, two examples of this. I feel like anytime I'm, I go for lunch or dinner with my mom, she's always like, she orders something and then she's like, oh, I didn't want this actually. I'm like, well, why did you, or, you know, well, come on, just trust your gut, just go with what you want. And then on mm -hmm. maybe a more deeper level, I find that a lot of times talking to someone and they're like, oh, I, that person maybe gives me a little bit of un unease or like, I don't really trust that person. I don't know why. And I feel like that is, trust that trust that like if yeah. someone you know if, the, if they if something just seems off trust your gut and remove yourself from that situation you know like don't don't try to be polite just because you know you, you, you the social whatever implications social of norms, it, right? yeah yeah for sure so it's a weird kind of a situation when it comes to all that stuff for yeah sure. one and another thing that i try to get people to sort of um get them to improve their intuition is just taking a blank piece of paper and then lining up a bunch of colors like mm. crayons or pencil crayons or paints whatever and choose three mm. right choose three colors and then just start making lines movement shape and just you can put on music that you're interested in listening to do whatever you want um and you're not going to show anyone so there, the idea of that you have to create something that looks good is gone, right? So you, it's just about making marks. So it can be, they can, heck, if you want, just do a bunch of circles, <laughs> like choose a shape and just draw a bunch of circles and stuff. And then what happens is that um, what's going on inside will come out. Mm -hmm. So the color, their choice of color comes out. Why did you choose those colors? right? Because you see these colors a certain way and you have a definition as to what those colors are, right? For me, red is warmth and energy and excitement, right? Purple is, for me, it means purple under the eyes, mm. sick. So purple and yellow are really bad colors for me. So when I'm choosing those colors, I, I um, get an understanding as to what's going on with me. Very I'm feeling low energy or whatever. So yeah, so those are the, 
those are good ways of like building up your intuition and, un- and then being able to look at it and dissect, oh, what's going on in this picture? Right. It sounds this very, is what's going on inside of me. That sounds very similar to journaling or, you know, just kind of writing down your thoughts without any direction or anything and then going back to it later and be like, oh, there's a, a, a couple themes here that I'm seeing that, that are interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so let's talk about your new art that's going up at the Forks, I think next week as of when we're recording this or when it comes out, it might be in a couple of days. Uh, yeah. Tell me, tell me about it. What's it called? What's the, what's the concept? And, and, and let's, let's hear it. Right. Well, um, Rick Frost from the Winnipeg Foundation, uh, he's the CEO and he's actually retiring on the day of the unveil. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. He had approached uh, Val Vint, uh, Jamie Isaac and myself, and he he told us the story about Chief Peguis that he had read. And um, and he's a big history buff. He's a big history buff. So So he he heard the story about how Chief Peguis um, had uh, his people um take the the selkirk settlers to a safe place because their their farms and their food and their their dwellings were being attacked and and so they wanted to to send them to a place where they'd be safe and um so there is a story about how chief Peguis had taken this little girl and put her on a horse I, whether or not that's true i don't know but he really, he was really drawn to this idea of, you know, uh, Chief Peguis's, um relationship with, with uh, the settlers, um, how he didn't want to get involved with fighting. And his belief was that everyone should just get along. Um, and so Rick really wanted us to think about that. Um, he wanted he wanted to get us to create um, public sculptures sort of in honor of thinking about that. And, mm-hmm. and I took that really to heart mm-hmm. um, when I was creating my piece. And I started thinking about the settler and indigenous relationship and how it, how in the beginning, especially with the chief Peguis and his stories and how he wanted to keep the peace and how he wanted to stay neutral and how he wanted just everyone to get along because that um, he saw everybody as like brothers, mm-hmm. you know, you're my brother. Mm-hmm. We're made of the same flesh and blood and we exist within this land and we're part of the nature natural world. And so he couldn't see a distinguishing factor between, between uh, all parties so I, I created originally a design that was called Brothers. Mm. And um, the idea was um, Peguis as, as the, one of the characters and, and a wolf as the other character, as the settler character. And it kind of morphed. Um, I started thinking about the stories of uh, Wisaki Jack. Uh, he is a... A character that is in a lot of storytelling and in Cree stories, and his relationship with the wolf. And um, so I started thinking about those relationships and um, between settler and indigenous. And I really wanted to um, ask the question how are you going to embrace me as a brother? Mm. So how are you going to embrace me as, um, how are we going to embrace one another, right? So the, the piece, which is uh, called Tennessee. <laughs> okay, I just got this translation. So okay, it's gotcha. really, uh, I'm going to see if I can get this. Tennessee, KK, Totamak, Kasis, Tinimi. So it means, uh, what can we do to respect each other? So it's, it's a question, what can we do? Yeah. And then to respect one another. So when you look at the, the sculpture, it's, it changed. It was originally going to be in cement, it was going to be sculpted, and then it changed into metal. And now I'm really, really excited about what it's going to look like. But basically the two characters, Wisaki Jack, um, is the indigenous representation and then the wolf is the settler representation Mm. and they're both looking at one another 
and you can look at it as a viewer as are they having a conversation that is good or is the wolf about to bite him <laughs> right so it's it's really asking that question how is our relationship going to come together right what is it going to be like in the future that's beautiful yeah um how often does you know as sort of a amateur songwriter how often i i can never finish things like i i, I, I nothing is ever like good enough to be done. So how do you come to that conclusion of like, Hey, it's done. We're going like, how do you, how do you, how do you know something is complete as an artist? Uh, you just have to have faith in your, your abilities. Hmm. And um, like that, I can't say that for everyone. Um, I don't think there is such thing as perfection. I think uh, we need to get that word out of our, our vocabulary when it comes to creation. Uh, hmm. There is no such thing. Um, I will always find fault into something for sure. Definitely um, ways that, you know, it could be better, but in the moment you have to realize like in the moment that is the best. Right. Right. So then it's again, lying, relying on my intuition and just saying, it's not the best, but it's the best for this moment. Yeah. And I just have to let that go. Believe me, I have looked at things and going, <laughs> oh, okay. I really wish I had done this, mm -hmm. but at the moment I hadn't thought of it. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's letting go because really when you're creating something, it's no longer yours once you put it out in the world. Right. Um, it, everything that you create is very personal. You have your own interpretations of it. It's made by you. It's, it's all the knowledge that you've accumulated to this point, this, the skills and the strengths that you have, the trauma that you may be going through, everything is all you. But then once you put it out in the world, it's no longer yours right. because the person, the viewer that's looking at it, they're coming from their own trauma or point of view or their own uh, education, uh, social status, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to interpret it differently. Their own perception. Yeah, their own perception. Yeah. Very good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been a moment uh, where you viewed someone um, experiencing your art and they maybe came with an interpretation that you that just blew your mind? Is there ever, is there a story or anything where someone's been like, hey, well, did you think of this? And you're like, I have I do now, you know, or is there anything that yeah. comes to mind? Yeah, definitely. I'm just like I had one. I did this photo series called Cyborg Hybrids mm -hmm. um, many years ago. But uh, you have to kind of look it up to understand the story. So I'm going to go with a, the Perception photo series. Uh, I was teaching at a school uh, predominantly um, non-Indigenous kids. Um, and uh, let's see, this school had a grade four or five teacher. I think she was a grade five teacher. And she knew I was in the school teaching other students clay. And she said, Casey, I have been teaching my students about your perception photo series. And we've had some really excellent conversations. The kids really want to meet you. And just if you can come, even if it's just for like the recess, we'll stay in and you can just talk with us for five, 10 minutes. And, and I said, sure. Yeah, that sounds great. No problem. I don't mind. And so I sat down with the kids and, you know, grade, I think they were grade five. And they were having such profound conversations. I just, I was shocked, first of all, that a grade five teacher was willing to talk about these really complex ideas. But the thing was, this is what was shocking, was the kids totally related to the work because they felt discriminated against through ageism. They said, you know what? It's really frustrating as a child to not have people listen to us, adults listen to us. You know, we have points of view. We have opinions and, um, you know, adults often dismiss what we're saying to them. And I was just like, this is insane. Oh my goodness. Like they totally understood. And I've had a lot of educators say to me, you know, this content really is only for kids from grade seven and up because it's too complex for them to discuss <laughs> this teacher. Um, she was amazing. She understood her students so well. 
and she felt that they would connect with this work and they they certainly did that's so because awesome. there was a lot of um there some some of the students were also um uh immigrant families um and they they felt it on another level mm -hmm. um and they connected to the work so so well i it was just extraordinary to yeah, me that would be yeah. so rewarding for you to yeah just, you know to to have that experience yeah and those are outcomes i never anticipated never mm -hmm. anticipated that's very cool well i know you're busy so i'm gonna get us wrapped up here but at the end of our time together um i do a segment with every guest called just because where it's the same seven questions about the causes you care about and the effect that it has had on your lives are you okay to go through those seven with me Sure. All right. Question. I'm not very good at being on the spot. So I'm hoping. I, honestly, I disagree. You've been in incredible today. So <laughs> we'll see. But I trust okay. you. Uh, question one is, what's the very first cause you ever remember caring about? Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sure I cared about stuff when I was a kid. For sure. Uh, I can't remember, though, because... I was pretty carefree. <laughs> Same, actually. Um, I just, it just necessarily like the first thing you were kind of like, you noticed that this was a thing that you should, you know, put some energy towards. It could be anything. <laughs> All right. Maybe you were right. I uh, know. I'm just thinking of something <laughs> a little different. Um, oh, that's okay. I that's just great. remember being on the toilet okay. and thinking about the expansion of the universe and how there was, it was infinite and it, how it just froze me mm. like just thinking about the concept of the universe and now how it's infinite and how very little we all are right freaked me out yeah that's a great that's a good one that'll definitely yeah. sort of um inspire some modesty in someone right like i'm an insignificant piece of dust flying around yeah. on a giant rock through through space yeah yeah great great answer uh question two so if money and politics and logistics were no issue at all for you and you could just snap your fingers and something would happen what would you do in support of your current cause or your your most important cause right now right so a big a big um, issue for me uh, is definitely environmental issues. Um, so education is a huge, huge thing for me. But if I, if my, if money wasn't an object, um, I think um, all the um, reserves that have um, issues with drinking mm. water, fresh water, uh, the ability to to drink clean water, um, I would make sure that every single one of them had fresh, clean drinking water. The those same communities, I would um, set up um, community center where all arts are promoted, because um, it's a way of having you know focus, and I think that would be amazing. Yeah, those are the two. So education is definitely something that's big. I, I definitely think constantly think about how I want to set up a scholarship mm. for Indigenous youth who are interested in uh, pursuing the arts as a career. So, so education and clean drinking water uh, for communities, I think, is key. Awesome. Well, I can I can give you an email of someone at the foundation who does scholarships and you can get that started, perhaps. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, question three. What's the biggest misunderstanding or stigma about your cause? So Nibe, um, which is uh, uh, water in Ojibwe, um, I think too many people think of water as a commodity and they don't recognize that water is life that water sustains us and that what we do to water is what we're doing to ourselves and we are treating ourselves horribly. So um, I think that's one of the issues is that people don't recognize um, that we are hurting ourselves and that we need to protect the waters because we need to protect ourselves and that it'll help um, our, our future uh, generations beautifully said could not yeah. agree more and yeah i think that's oh, one of the great not failings maybe of our generation is the, is the 
you know, why are we bought? Like, it's weird that we are capitalizing on something that is just fundamental to human life. You know, it's weird that we're bottling millions of bottles of water and selling it to people when people don't have it to drink. Uh, It just boggles my mind. But yeah, that could be a conversation for, you know, for hours that we could have. But we'll move on. Uh, Question four. What is a time in your life where you had to pivot because plan A wasn't working out? So plan you had to go to plan B. Um, I'm sure I've had a lot of them actually. <laughs> Every day, perhaps. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's hard for. Uh, it's hard for me. Like I just recently had um, that kind of experience. I was supposed to give a talk, and everything was going against me. Uh, no matter how hard it was one of those dreams, you know, when you have one of those dreams where you just can't make it to the exam room Mm -hmm. and you're trying and you're trying. I had that happen to me. I had that happen to me just recently and uh, things were just not working out. I couldn't, I couldn't prepare the way I usually prepare and things were just not working out. And as it turned out, um, instead of just canceling right away, And just recognizing and being in the moment and and just saying, okay, I'm in the middle of a family emergency and I need to help this person who's going through this family emergency and just cancel. Those obligations felt stronger Mm. than having to help. So in the end, I had to cancel Mm -hmm. and I kind of went back and went, you know what, you weren't listening. You know, everything was telling you to stop. And, and, and you just kept trying to press forward. So, yeah. <laughs> Trust that intuition, right? Like Trust exactly what we're talking about. I didn't. Trust, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, there's so many times, like it, I've been sort of working personally with uh, how to understand, you know, setting boundaries when it comes to life and personal, you know, situations and stuff. And that's a big part of it is just like, you don't want to say no, but trust your gut. If your gut's saying, hey, we should probably say no, then trust that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important. Uh, question five, what's the best advice that you've ever been given? So early on in my career, um, I wasn't raised with my culture. And uh, though my father was very proud of his indigenous um, heritage, my mom wasn't. And we weren't raised knowing too much about it. Um, and so I never felt like I had access to it. Mm. I never felt I had a right to it. Mm. And um I didn't realize at the time that that's, you know, a product of the Indian Act and residential schools, this shame of learning about who you are and where you come from, right? Uh, So Cheryl Lirandell, who just won a Governor General Award um, for her contribution in media arts, um, I met her in 2001 and, you know, I was talking to her about, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm indigenous and everything. I don't know what it means. And Mm. I don't feel like I have any rights to it. And she said, you know what, Casey, you have every rights to your, your culture. And she said, you know what, Irish people go to Ireland all the time. (laughs) Scottish people go to Scotland all the time to learn about their roots and where they come from. And nobody questions that. So there shouldn't be any reason why you should question your ability to learn about your culture. And it was like, Mm. She, she gave me that permission to walk through that threshold and it changed my life. That's it, beautiful. It changed my life in a, such a wonderful, wonderful way. Yeah. Cause there's probably such a wide, like there's an infinite amount of things that you can now research and look into and explore yeah. and, and learn about. Yeah. But it's also like being proud of who you are mm. because I wasn't proud of who I was at that point in time because right. I had no access to it and I had no guidance. And she was one of those first people that guided me. The same with my friend, Kathy Mattis. She had been telling me over and over and over again that you can learn about and you can represent your, your culture. And uh, I just kept saying, no, I can't. No, I don't have rights to it. And so Cheryl Larendale really changed to that for me. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool story. Uh, question six, what is the, or sorry, what advice would you give your 10 year old self if you could go back in time and talk to her right now? Oh, I know. I often think about, oh boy, if I could only go back in time and talk to myself, <laughs> but in, in a lot of ways, I, I recognize that I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I 
work to change anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I went through all these processes for a reason. So I wouldn't tell myself anything because, you know, life is about the journey, not the destination. And I had to go through a lot of painful things to get where I am right now. Yeah. And so I, I wouldn't want to change any of it. I love it. Very good answer. Yeah. My, my, one of my best friends, Dennis, he told me pain is only weakness leaving the body when we were young. And I was like, huh, all right. Wow. Well. That's pa great. Powerful. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Intense. Well, mm -hmm. Casey, thank you so much. I guess we'll see you in a week on Thursday. The last question is usually the hardest one. Question seven is what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I want to be remembered as an educator. Um, you know, one of the reasons why uh, I'm so happy with me mama that, uh, Jamie, Isaac, and Val Vint and myself, um, we collaborated together in making that piece. You know, the piece talks about water, it talks about motherhood, it talks about Mother Earth, it talks about our connection to land and water, like not, not just Indigenous folk, but all of our connections to land and water. And, um, you know, that's the kind of, that knowledge, that, that ability to teach people visually what's going on in our world today, um, I think that's something that I want uh, people to remember me by is my need to pass on knowledge and to, to uplift others. Beautiful. That's really what I want, want to do in my life. Well, thank you for passing your knowledge to me and to everyone. I mean, my girlfriend and I, when we go to the Forks, we always go see Nima Man and just kind of stand in awe of her beauty. And it's a gorgeous... I can't wait to see your I new mean, thing too. We're just... We're just so pleased. I mean, that that sculpture just keeps giving and giving and giving. And, you know, I walk by it every time and I'm in awe of it exactly. as well. So, it's yeah, I'm glad to see that um, she's being received in such a lovely way. And yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll see you next week at the uh, unveiling of your new piece. Uh, thank you for your yes, time. I'm very excited about it. It's, for sure. It's going to yeah. be cool. It'll be great. Thank you again for being here, for being on the podcast. And uh, yeah, take care of yourself and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>